I, love, I enjoyed the children's story today, too. You know, uh, we're all children here. All of us are special in his sight. And uh, it's just an amazing thing that all of us are precious stones in that wonderful building that's called the temple, God's house. And it takes every one of us to make that temple uh, complete. And Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone of that temple. Isn't that neat? You can't hardly wrap your tongue around those kind of ideas. So we want to welcome you all today to our service. Uh, why did we come here anyway? We call this the worship hour, right? We came here to worship God. And um, before we get started, I'd like to just have an added word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, as we open your word today, we pray that we will see Jesus in his beauty, that it might inspire us, Lord, to be connected to him. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, worship. Worship is a most fundamental preoccupation. You and I will bow down to someone or something. Um, and that someone or something will have the deepest affection of which we are capable. We look for someone or something to fill the deepest needs of our hearts. Just stand back and look a little bit at the way the worship goes in the world. The majority of the world doesn't know Jesus. And you think about places like uh, where Buddhism is uh, the religion. Uh, and uh, Hinduism, Hinduism in India. Ranging from the horrible to the sublime in those eastern lands in seemingly endless forms, men are seeking peace and meaning for life in their tireless search, search for acceptance of God. And Buddhism, with the uh, yellow robe, robed monks and, and palm leaf umbrellas and prayer wheels, elaborate rituals, 500 million people are worshiping that way, trying to find inner cleansing and that meditate in that meditative and passive religion. And in China, the teachings of Confucius and the world of Islam with its submission and its prophet spanning half the globe, these all have a burning sincerity to, to, to know God and to have meaning for their life. And then there's Judaism. Those, uh, that proud heritage, uh, associated with keeping the law to find meaning for life and to find cleansing. And these Eastern religions are the majority of the people on the earth who don't know Jesus. Um, is Christianity any different than all of these things? You know, when we think of the people around us, uh, even, even perhaps in Sierra Vista, there are many people who don't know the Lord. Is Christianity something different than all of these things that people are used to seeing and, and worshiping? What does Christianity offer that the others do not? Are its ceremonies more potent to cleanse and gain acceptance with God than the pagan religions? Or, or does it really matter? And I've had people tell me that, well, you know, I believe this way, you believe that way. They're all paths that lead to heaven. Um, is Christianity just another form of searching for God through the inherent urge to worship? Because we all have that urge. That's the way we're made. It's in our DNA to worship something. Then at last, find unsatisfied fulfillment. Is Christianity only another philosophy of life that has evolved slowly over, this, over the last 2,000 years? from some ancient tradition? These are important questions in today's world. How does a person really find acceptance with God? In the end time of the world, Adventists have believed and have taught that God himself visited our planet 
on a long and dangerous journey. I say a long and dangerous journey. In the book, Desire of Ages, it says that there was risk involved. I've pondered that statement a little bit. Risk involved for God. In which God himself felt the terror and the pain and the torture of evil and sin on behalf of the world's inhabitants. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 and that God in human flesh tastes death, tastes death for every person. 6,000 years of people as a substitute and surety. Substitute and surety. Those are words that you'll find in the spirit of prophecy quite a bit. Substitute and surety. Somebody's my substitute. And also my surety. We're going to read a couple of texts about that in a minute. But what does surety really mean? You really don't understand a little bit about what it means until maybe you've co-signed with somebody that's in debt <laughs> and uh, that somebody doesn't pay the bill and uh, guess what? You get a letter from the bank and the bank says, well, three months have passed and we haven't had any activity on this account, so now it's up to you. You've signed the line. You're the surety. I've had that happen. <laughs> it's a long, long time ago. But it was a lesson learned in the economic world. But Jesus is our surety. The whole world is in debt. A debt so big, Jesus told a parable one time about the two debtors. A million lifetimes could not produce enough goodness in order to pay that debt. And uh, so substitute and surety for all who look in the right place and believe. I appreciate that in the prayer this morning. Let's look at some scriptures. I'd like to, first of all, if you have your Bibles, and uh, if you're watching on YouTube this afternoon, if you could bring a Bible close by, we're going to read a few texts. These are tremendously comforting texts to me, and I know they will be to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. I'll give you time to... To find it. Looks like most of you have Bibles. And I uh, invite you to follow along. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. He died for every last person on this planet. Is that right? His death was efficacious for a whole world of people. Let's look at another one. Hebrews 7, verse 22. This is the one that talks about surety. Hebrews 7, verse 22. But so, by so much was Jesus made a, what is the word? Surety. surety for a better testament or a better covenant. Jesus had made a surety. Because we're all hopelessly, we're all hopelessly in debt. And then the memory verse this morning or the scripture reading this morning, I'm sorry, that Matt wrote, read to us from, John, from Romans, the 16th chapter of the jailer. He heard the word. He was greatly encouraged, and his whole family were baptized that same night. Isn't that amazing? It's an amazing story. If I could put it, put it all in a capsule, uh, the great difference between Christianity and the Eastern religions of those other lands is that in that capsule would be three words, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Three words. Man, a man, capital M, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in these three acts is made possible all that God desires for man. Definition of the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is probably one of the best definitions of the gospel that I know of in the Bible. It's 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Paul says here, I've been preaching the gospel to you. And then he explains what it is. 15 verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, 
by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory that I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Definition of the gospel. This was the profound conviction which arose from witnessing these three acts, death, burial, and resurrection. It caused a, whole, a handful of men to run all over the, all over the world, uh, all of them persecuted, hunted down like animals, all except one of them was a martyr. And uh, John uh, died perhaps a natural death, but tradition has it that he was put into a pot of boiling oil, so really he died in principle of martyr's death, right? Fox's Book of Martyrs talks about they had to fish him out of the pot of boiling oil. Reminds you of the three, three worthies. What motivated these people to preach and teach and go all over the, planet, all over the world, the then known world, so much so that by A.D. 62, it could be said that every creature under heaven had heard the gospel. Every creature under heaven. You know, uh, Thomas went over to India, and some of his, uh, some of his uh, companions made it way over into the Orient. There was a book written by a man by the name of Wilkinson a number of years ago, uh, The Church Triumphant. It talks about how, how the gospel was carried by foot and by voice everywhere. Some of them made it up into Europe and Northern Africa. And uh, what motivated these men to do all of this? It's just an amazing thing. They turned the world upside down. They transformed pagan society, not by mere argument, but in Holy Spirit power. That's what we need today is Holy Spirit power. Let's read about what the commission that was given to them. It's found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Our mission field is where? Right where we are. It might be in our home. It might be on the street in which we live. And certainly in this town, in this valley, right? But notice the encouraging words that were given to these, to these disciples. But ye shall have power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. What an idea. The very power of God. Another text that comes to my mind is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. Uh, Paul Harvey said, wash out your ears with this. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. I think that's wonderful advice. Let's wash out our eyes. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto them which are saved, it is the power of God. And Romans 1, 16 and 17, we all know that one probably, almost by heart. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Let's look at this with meaning. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, that is in the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, Christianity is the only faith religion in the whole world. The rest of it is a works program, it's trying to scramble and put all the energy we have into, into getting acceptance with God, and, and Christianity is a faith religion. That is probably the great difference. That's what the gospel is. It's the power of God. In the first century, a worldwide movement, if you will, it was to keep these vital acts of the apostles 
in delivering the death, burial, and, revel- and, res- and resurrection of Jesus. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. They talked a lot about the resurrection. It's an amazing thing. Uh, it was to keep these vital things alive that they went to the ends of the earth to do this. And God has given a meaningful ceremony. In a few days, we're going to have a baptism here, a few weeks. And I want to just kind of prepare us for that a little bit. We don't have enough baptisms. <laughs> you know, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized in one day. And the church multiplied. It wasn't by addition, but it was multiplied in the, in the following verses, Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6. It's a wonderful thing, you know. And um, so a meaningful ceremony, the ceremony is called baptism. Right in the heart of the book of Romans, Paul, the great apostle, describes the significance of baptism. When we talk about this, we really are on holy ground. Let's look at it. Romans chapter 6, right in the heart of the gospel of Romans. Romans chapter 6, let's start there about verse verse 3, 3 to 6. Romans 6, 3 to 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried by him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You know, this, has an, this, this, this will have a, a powerful impact on everyone who believes because a little farther down in the chapter is that sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, you will not be prisoners of sin, even though we're still sinners, right? Acts 2, verse 38. This is one that maybe you have memorized at one time or another. Powerful text, Acts 2, verse 38. It says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. What does it say next? Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins that ye shall, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those are comforting words. I don't know if there's someone here who would be looking forward to baptism. I'm not sure about that. I'm kind of new here. Maybe that's a good thing. Baptism is a very important idea because we identify with, he identified with us. His death, burial, and resurrection, he duplicates in every person that lives that comes to him in faith. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Another one, Galatians 3. Galatians 3, 26. Galatians 3, 26 to 28, to 29, really. The whole chapter's good. Galatians 3, I hope you read that chapter. Read it often. It's the gospel. Galatians 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in in Christ Jesus. He's talking to the church here. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ. The gospel is the great leveler. It's the great leveler in the church. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And understanding of these texts is what we call the gospel, the good tidings of salvation, foreshadowed all through the Old Testament, beginning at the gates of Eden, where lambs were sat, where a, a, an innocent animal was sacrificed. And the people wore the skin of animals then. Can't imagine it. The Old Testament is a gigantic prophecy beginning there. And all the sacrifices down through the Old Testament times, beginning with Adam and Abel and Noah and Abraham. Abraham was a pretty rich man, 
he had a lot of flocks and herds. And uh, in Canaan, he had a household. I heard an estimate one time, a household of maybe of almost a thousand people, people working for him. And those animals ate a lot of grass, and they moved on, and they moved on, and they moved on in a nomadic type of life. <clears throat> and everywhere he went, he built, what did he do? He built an altar. I wonder what people think when they drive by here on Sabbath. <clears throat> Cars in the parking lot. The Sabbath is a monument to the great creator God that we all serve. Your presence here on Sabbath morning is a monument. Sabbath is a monument in time. We could talk about uh, Isaac and Jacob. All of them were, were, were part of that gigantic prophecy that pointed forward to one thing. The Old Testament just moves toward one point, right? The coming of Jesus, his, his birth, his life, his burial, and his resurrection, and finally his ascension to heaven. And uh, it was all foreshadowed. Gigantic prophecy continues right down to the final generation in earth's history because we still have been given the commission to proclaim the everlasting gospel. Let's read it. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. This is our commission. A number of gospel commissions are mentioned in the Bible. There's one in Mark and one in Matthew. Uh, Luke has one. This is our commission, living at the time of the end. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And just before Jesus comes, I like to read uh, 6 and 7. I won't read the whole three angel messages, but, but um, the rest of the three angel messages is really a summary of those first two or three words. Revelation 14. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The everlasting gospel, everything that follows that in the three angels' message is a, is a supplement to that. That's our commission. If we read on down through, scroll down through to verse 12, and... Um, Talks about the patience of the saints, keeping the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. Christianity is a faith religion. And then two verses down from that is the second coming. We're proclaiming that message, and we're down at the end of time when Jesus is about ready to come. Let's read verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. What is the sickle for? To reap. To reap the earth's harvest. The angels be going around the four corners of the earth as Jesus comes into heaven. Jesus has a sickle in his hand. And verse 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. The last message of mercy to a world, riddled with everything evil that you can think of. In the midst of that is the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. It sets apart from everything else that's going on in the world. In India, these people who will crawl on hand and knee for miles until blood comes, they'll flagellate themselves in the back until the blood flows. They will walk through burning coals, anything to appease those angry gods, anything to be clean. And the everlasting gospel hopefully is at their doorstep in Sierra Vista. Thank God there's a better way. The way that leads to Calvary, the resurrection, death, burial, resurrection. It's not cheap grace on God's part. We must never think of it as cheap, but it costs someone a lot to get it for us. It costs someone an infinite price. I remember reading the Spirit of Prophecy that all heaven was poured out in one gift. I can't imagine it. All the wealth of heaven, the gold of love that was in the, in the Savior on our behalf. To help frail minds like mine understand some of this, we have the ordinance of baptism. 
one that shows how it is accomplished. Unfortunately, God's plan has been bypassed even in many in, the, in mainstream Christianity. But in the ceremony of baptism is portrayed the links to which a loving God will go to purchase salvation for, for us. And if we really see it, it will break the most stubborn heart. Turn with me to Matthew 16, verse 24. Matthew 16, verse 24. This verse has uh, stirred up a lot of uh, inquisitiveness as to what it really means. Verse 24. Steve, we had this in a Bible study the other night. Wasn't this one of the two texts that that he brought up? Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And uh, what does that mean? Somebody might say, well, I'm having trouble at home. That's the cross I just have to bear. I have to bear that in my my life. Or uh, maybe my bills aren't getting paid and I'm concerned about losing my house or something. That's the cross I'm going to have to bear. But the cross of Jesus led only to one place. And where was that? The lonely hill. A few people sitting there watching him being crucified. It uh, led to the death of our Savior. Um, And what he did on that cross was like we read in 1 Corinthians 1.18. It is the power of God. The power of love that will break hearts. What an idea. When we take up that cross and follow Jesus, it leads only to one place. The place of death to self. Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but what? Christ lives in me. I died, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. What an idea that is. With Jesus... It was the burden of the second death, the eternal separation that he felt that he was going to have from his father. In his humanity, he hangs there. Probably it starts in Gethsemane. My God, and then finding the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His total friend, his only friend at this point. And so with Jesus, it was the burden of the second death. It was separation from the father. To him, it was sheer terror. I'm going to share a little bit here from prayer meeting Wednesday night. I invite you to prayer meeting on Wednesday night, but I want to go through this again because it's uh, been such a powerful thing to me. And Ellen White, Desire of Ages, she describes the horrible anguish that Christ endured in my place. Read that chapter again. One of these days, we're going to have a communion service here. It's important that we understand this. She says that Jesus could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. For years, I... I read that and I puzzled over that, thought about that. What does that mean? He saw only the eternal death for himself, the eternal separation from his father, for whom he had an infinite love. And as he suffers there, it's an infinite suffering because God has an infinite capacity to suffer. I hit the wrong nail one day and it hurt like crazy. Thumbnail turned black and hurt for a long time. Finally went to a doctor and he took a drill, like a dental drill, and drilled through that fingernail, <laughs> let out the pressure. Some of you've had that experience. I can see the looks on your faces. But that's not infinite pain. We don't know what pain is. And yet, he saw you and I in Gethsemane and on the cross. If he hadn't been strengthened that night, he would have died right there in the garden. He was willing to risk his own well-being, maybe in his own existence, because in his humanity, he was struggling with existence. And after reading that passage in Desire of Ages, I often wondered if something like that could be found in the Bible, a statement that's clear like that, 
that Jesus was willing to, to give up his existence for me and his eternal separation from the Father. And uh, you know the Psalms, it's in the, one of the Psalms is dedicated to that. It's the 88th Psalm. I hope you'll go home and read that whole Psalm this afternoon, a good Sabbath afternoon read. The 88th Psalm. The Old Testament church sang the Psalms. That was the, what they sang. And every one of them, you can go through the whole, the whole group of Psalms. They're all messianic. They're all pointing to Jesus. That's what they sang about, the coming of the Messiah. So I'd like to invite you to turn to Psalm, the 88th chapter, where Jesus pours out his passion. Now, really, David is the, is the one who, who first uh, penned most of these Psalms, and he is telling his own experience, but he's a type of Christ because Jesus went through some, some, some things that were even much beyond what David could possibly endure. But let's uh, look, 88th Psalm. Verse 6, thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness and lost my place and in deeps, in the deeps. And verse 8, thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from thee, from, far from me. He's talking to his father now. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up. I cannot come forth. Those are powerful. That's a powerful expression. I cannot come forth. Verse 14. O Lord, thou castest thou off, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thy face from me? I'm afflicted and ready to die. For my youth up, Jesus was born here to die. For my youth up, while I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. Here the word terror is used. That's a strong word too. Jesus experienced terror on the cross, terror. They came around me daily. They came round about me like daily like water. They come past me all to, about together. Now he's talking to his father, lover and friend. Hast thou put far from me and my acquaintance into darkness? That's how Jesus died. And you know what? He was looking. He was looking at Craig and Wayne. And every one of us, as he was willing to do all these things. For Jesus, it was sheer terror. That's the penalty of, for sin. That's the penalty of separating from God. It's not that God is mad at people and angry at people and, and uh, wrathfully like the ancient gods uh, trying to destroy people. That's what sin does when we separate ourselves from life. And there's terror. We're, we're meant to have the love of God in our hearts. And uh, all of that goodness brings, brings, brings uh, life. Notice the plight of the wicked who refuse to believe. Psalm 37, verses 10 and 20. Psalm 37, verses 10 and 20. This is what it would be like for all of us if Jesus hadn't come. Not that God is mad at us. No, that's not it. It's because we cut ourselves off. Verse 10 says, that's Psalm 37, verse 10. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. And verse 20. For the wicked shall perish. That's a very powerful word, too. That's in John 3, 16. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. You think that uh, you think that if I really saw the significance of what Jesus did, that He took my place at such a great cost, you'd think that it would bring such a love in my heart for Him that I would crave fellowship with Jesus. It would cause me to love Him so supremely that I would rather die than sin. that I would fall on my face and worship him. You know, in Revelation 11, people who really get this, it says they fall on their face and worship him.
That's what it's designed to do, to bring forth worship for such a God. That love is available. Heaven does have a perfect plan. A couple more texts. Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 5.5. 5. This text talks about love. Romans 5.5. 5. And hope make it not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Romans 13. This is a definition of love. That love that uh, is spoken of there, love of God, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Revelation 13 is a definition of that love. Starting with verse 8. Render therefore all that are perceived. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. We don't have any question here what law this is talking about. Thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. That's the Bible definition of love. Daniel, if I love you, I won't lie to you. And Theo, if I love you, I won't steal from you. That's the definition of love. And if we love God supremely, we will not have any of the gods before him. We will not make any graven images. We will not take his name in vain and we will keep Sabbath holy. That's love. That's what love is. This is a description of God. The law is a transcript of God's character. And the Bible says that God is what? God is love. And John 14, 15. Who can quote that for me? If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So how does this happen? The Holy Spirit plants love in my heart so that I can appreciate what God has done for me. It's called the miracle of the new birth. For constraint of time, I'm not going to go to Nicodemus' midnight or nighttime visit with Jesus, but he goes there and Jesus tells him, you know, you have to be born again. But you can't be born until you die, right? The message for Nicodemus was, look, look in the right place, look and live, like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, for God loved you. All of that's the message to Nicodemus. That's what the Holy Spirit does for me. He helps me look in the right direction and gives me fresh glimpses of Jesus, Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15, here's what it says. And it says it three times in those three verses. The Holy Spirit is the great shower. If we spend our time studying the Bible, he will show us Jesus. Uh, because this book is about him. We shouldn't study the Bible to try to win an argument. We should study the Bible in order to know who? To know Jesus. Right? And the Holy Spirit's special work is to point us in that direction. Um, he's the great shower to show us Jesus and the links that Jesus was willing to go on my behalf. You think we should be praying for the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Zechariah chapter 10 verse one says that we should pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. Now the latter rain is not falling, but it will fall soon. And I believe that we are living in the time of the latter rain. It says pray for the latter rain in the time of the Latter rain. Can we see the difference between this and the pagan religions of the world? Jesus came to us because we could not go to him. The Bible says we would not even seek after him if he did not come and the Holy Spirit show us what he is to us. Pray for the Holy Spirit. 
I would like to have us turn to Second First Samuel chapter two. This is the prayer of uh, Hannah. First Samuel chapter two. Hannah is the mother of Samuel, and she had a great burden on her heart. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter two. Verses 6 to 9, here's Hannah's prayer. This is the mother's prayer. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. Have you ever felt that? I felt that. The Lord maketh poor. Makes you feel, you know, your need for him. That's what humility will do for us. The Lord maketh the poor and maketh the rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the beggar from the dunghill. <laughs> I want to emphasize that word. That's where he found us. To set them among princes, to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. By our strength no man will prevail. Hannah's Prayer. I'd like to take you to another place, Matthew chapter 3, Matthew the third chapter. I'm going to run about five minutes over here, looks like. Matthew chapter 3. This is a powerful passage, and I want to start about verse 13. Matthew 3, beginning with verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to, to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And another rendition of this, rendering of this, a similar, a similar type, Hear ye him. George Vanderman. You all know who George Vanderman was? He is a great storyteller. He told a story. The story was about a visit that he made to Palestine. I've never been to Palestine. You've probably been to Palestine. Have you been to Palestine? Yeah. He tells a story. He was on a plane. And on the plane, he got into a conversation with a stewardess. And she told him that, he had trained in a Christ, that she had trained in a Christian hospital, became a Christian nurse in Bangkok. Oh, I'm sorry, in Baghdad. And became a Christian. And later, a missionary nurse. She had lost her way over the years, drifted away from Christ, now bitterly entangled in a disappointing web of sin. She shared this with him. They talked earnestly about release and cleansing and that she so desperately needed. As the plane approached and banked over the River Jordan, they were coming close to the Jordan, the stewardess exclaimed, there it is! They apparently had been talking about baptism, right? Obviously. She said, there it is, the Jordan River. It's the place where Jesus was baptized. And so, as the plane banked, there it was. But it had lost some of its glory. Jesus wasn't there. John the Baptist wasn't there. Yet he said, the scene seemed to come alive again. It was there that Jesus stepped out of the water with dripping garments and knelt humbly on Jordan's banks. And heaven broke the silence. 
This is my beloved son in whom I will, am well pleased. And God spoke the gospel to that prodigal that day. And uh, she was forgiven again by a cleansing made possible by Jesus almost 2,000 years ago. What an idea. A final thought this morning. Do you want to be clean? John chapter 15, beautiful chapter. I'd like to read verses 3 and 5. John 15, verses 3 and 5. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. This could be an allusion to the sanctuary. As you enter the holy place of the sanctuary through the, through the door, on your right is the, bread, the table with the bread on it, right? To your left is the Holy Spirit, the flames of fire. And as we pick up the word and begin to read the word, the Holy Spirit illuminates the word for us. And as we learn to know Jesus, we are clean through the word. And verse 5. The last part, for without me you can do nothing. That's the secret of the sanctified life, through the word. The Holy Spirit always working through the word on our behalf. Now what if we leave the word on the nightstand and never pick it up and it gathers dust? Doesn't work, does it? You're clean through the word. And when we spend time in the word, Jesus is seen in his beauty. He's done all the work. We have the privilege of walking with him. This is a walk and not a work. It's a walk, not a work. Walking with him. What do friends do when they walk? They talk. <laughs> okay. And right in front of you is the altar of incense. The prayers of the saints ascend with the righteousness of Christ to the throne of glory. Okay. In the holy place you have sanctification. This is the daily prefigured in the ancient sanctuary prefigured Christ's work in the the sanctuary in heaven where he ever lives to make intercession for us. It's a walk, not a work. Friends walk and they talk. Friendship. We're in in chapter 15 here. Uh, Notice uh, verse 15. Chapter 15, verse 15. It's easy to remember. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. In his earthly sojourn, he left nothing, no secrets. He shared it all with us through the word. I want to invite you today to give your heart to Jesus. There may be some here who have never done that in a meaningful way. I'm not going to point anybody out this morning. Nobody's going to be embarrassed. But I just want you to know that I give you that invitation. Give your heart to Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. How can anyone who has seen this and tasted of this not want to do that? Jesus gives himself gives the invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you Sabbath. That's what Sabbath is to us, isn't it? It's rest. There may be someone here who has not yet done that in a meaningful way. Maybe you want to renew your commitment to Jesus. I want to pray for you in a minute. Now is the right time. If it's not now, when? For Jesus, there was no convenient time. But he did it. He promised it. He was faithful to the heavenly vision. Galatians 4.4 says that when the fullness of time was come, Jesus knew the time. And when the time came, he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There was no convenient time for Jesus, but he did it. And when the right time came, Jesus was obedient to the heavenly vision. He set his face like a flint to Jerusalem. He endured the, the uh, penalty for our my sin and paid all the bills that I owe to the law. Such is the love of God. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, 
We're sitting here this morning in your house, in this little chapel, Lord. We crave your presence in our minds and our lives right now through the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you will put sincerity into our hearts, that we might see the awesome time to which we have come. And we know that you want to do a great work for each one of us. All of us are precious stones in your temple. Help us to see the value that you have in us so that we might proclaim you to those around us. And as the evil things of the world begin to settle in, we pray, Lord, that we will not have fear. I pray that you'll protect each of us that are here this morning. Protect our little church, Lord, from the virus. Protect us, Lord, from the evil. And we look forward, Lord, to your coming. We know it's soon. And now is the time to be ready. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.